All right there, welcome everybody. It's Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. My name's Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network, and we are here to draw today. And if, if, you've, if you're reading the description below, you're going to have recognized as evidence in the chat that we have a unique material to add to the list today. And I had not planned to do this until very recently when I, as I was doing some research into uh, Van Gogh's drawing process. So I'm going to get into that. So um, if you're new, you're going to want to know that this show is all about us getting together to draw together because it is very helpful as artists to take some time out of our busy lives to draw. It's helpful for everybody, really. I mean, I, I try to encourage everybody to draw as much as possible. In this show, though, we choose a new subject each week, and then we use that subject to help us grow our skills in particular ways. This is part of our series we've been doing once a month where we have a master artist that we are copying. And the goal of this exercise is to try to put ourselves into the mind of the artist. So we're trying to deconstruct the process, really analyze the marks to see what we can discover about the mindset, about the decisions, about the intention behind uh, the marks that we're seeing on the page, and seeing how we can apply that to our own work, if there's anything there. So um, this is a really helpful skill to do a master copy. If you haven't seen any of the previous ones, you can go back. You can look at Michelangelo. We've done Degas um, and others. So check those out. Um, you're also going to want to know that you can find a link to the reference. This is taken from the Wikimedia Commons. Um, so you can find that in the link below. And you can also find a link to the show page where you can share your work when you're done. So I encourage you all to share your work. Um, I apologize for those of you who have been sharing. Um, I realize that there may have been some uh, images that weren't being displayed. That's on me because I I wasn't going in and I need to I need to approve them and I didn't do that and I feel awful. So I went through today and I approved any ones that were waiting there. So I encourage you to share your work when you're done. All right, let's get to it. This is what we're working on. This is a drawing of the Van Gogh. Now I chose this. One, because it's a drawing, and it happens to be in graphite. Uh, Van Gogh did quite a few pen and ink drawings, and I wasn't quite ready to tackle that. Um, you know, of course, he's, he's more known for his paintings. Um, but I thought that this is something that we could tackle in, in relatively an easy session. And what's also interesting about it is it's a bit larger. So I've, I've actually shrunk this down. This is, um, what size is this? This is, this is about nine inches. This sheet here is a 12 by 16, and I believe the original is on a 12 by 19 sheet. So that's a good size. The scale at which I'll be working is a little bit smaller than the original, but bigger than this test piece here. Looking at this test piece, there are lots of issues that I'm seeing with the proportions, but my goal is really to, to try to analyze the marks. So I hope in this attempt, we'll be kind of improving on the proportions and try to make it a little bit more accurate. Now, the milk. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. So when when looking at the, this work, you can see right next to me, uh, other side of the screen, you can see um, there's a there's a tone to the paper, and then seeing the white edge exposed, it got me thinking. Did he did he apply a light ink wash to the surface before drawing? Um, was he working in water soluble graphite, if that was a, such a thing at his time? Um, and I know there are quite a few questions there um, that uh, about working with a water soluble graphite, and I'm not sure if it will work. If you do try it, I would love to see the results. Um, what I discovered, though, in in a short amount of research, and a credit to, to people whose work I am I am leveraging right now for my own benefit, um, he used. Uh, and as was common at the time, uh, skim milk essentially as a fixative for the drawing. Um, so watered down milk is what it was referred to. So he would have had whole milk, he would have watered it down, really using the casein in the milk as a binder. That's what I did here. So that's why I'm working on watercolor paper. Um, and, and you can see that it picks up some of the tone on the graphite and how closely it aligns with what we're seeing in the original. Um, and it it affects the overall contrast in the piece. It softens the, the work a little bit, um, and it provides this really unique quality to the marks that I was really kind of curious about as I was you know, starting this, this drawing, um, how, you know, how do I get the pencil to look the way he did? And I thought, well, maybe it's just totally different materials, totally different graphite or something. But 
you you when you when you try a skim milk wash over your drawing, it's it's really amazing what it does. So this is totally coated. There's no nothing. That's actually from a previous drawing. There's nothing really coming up at all. It does an amazing job of fixing a drawing. Now the challenge is it does bleed a little bit, and I've heard that um, even other artists uh, like Degas may have used this on like pastel work or some of his drawings. So pretty wild stuff. Um, all right, now let me look at some of the other. Oops, sorry, look at some of the other uh, materials. Keeping it really simple, Van Gogh liked to work with this thing here, a carpenter's pencil. Um, so that's what I'm working on today. And I am a little disappointed in myself that it took me so long to start drawing with a carpenter's pencil because I love this thing so much. <laughs> so if you haven't worked with it, give it a shot. I, I'm i really excited to do it today. This is my first drawing with a carpenter's pencil, I, I think really ever. Um, this is a, a 4B, so it's relatively soft. It creates a beautiful variety of marks, um, just using a razor blade to kind of shape this down. And I, I had worked on a different drawing afterwards, so that's where all this stuff comes from. So keeping it simple, carpenter's pencil, kneaded eraser. This is hot press watercolor paper. This is actually um, Derwent, is it Derwent, who, what is it? I can't remember. It's the, the Derwent light fast paper is what it is. Um, Fantastic stuff. So that's what I'll be working on today. Um, and then the milk I have just in a little cup. There's a little watercolor cup and then I have a wide flat watercolor brush. So we'll get that to the end. Uh, I kind of learned a little bit about the technique, but if anybody out there has used skim milk applied with a brush specifically um, to fix the drawing, I'd love to hear your experiences. Now, um, the I have seen videos you know, in exploring all of this, um, people just using skim milk in a spray bottle, and that's probably a better and safer way to do it. Um, but I figured he probably didn't have a spray bottle with him. I, my guess is that he applied it with a brush. And one of the reasons I'm guessing that is that, well, I'll take out my drawing. You can just see the variation along the bottom and along, especially along this side, that on, on the original work that suggests that it was kind of an uneven distribution. Um, and, and because it was lighter in the top, I imagine him kind of working his way down to the bottom from top left to lower right. So kind of some deductive reasoning, and I could be wildly inaccurate with those observations, but that's what we have right now. That's one of the challenges to working with a master copy. Um, now, I see a lot of comments. I hope I am not missing any important questions. Uh, Maria, I do see your, um, your question about water-soluble graphite. It might work, um, but I think it might work in a different way. Um, like I said, give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Um, if you are new, I want to welcome you. Welcome to the whole community. This is a fun place to be, so glad you made it. Um, okay, and then I do want to see if anybody has any other questions. Um, thank you, Rachel, for sharing the bridge episode. Um, I should do another bridge soon, I think. All right, Greg, I can't wait to see what work you are uh, working on today. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Ania, so this Derwent Life Fast paper, it's, it's a hot press watercolor paper. Um, it's what it says, so I think. Um, what I did for this is I did dampen it and then kind of stretch it as I taped it down. Um, so hopefully it will handle the buckles a little bit better. But this this was just applied loosely. Um, just to the front, I didn't tape it down. No, I guess I did tape it down, but I didn't um, pre-dampen it or anything like that. I didn't do anything to the backside, and it buckled a bit. Um, it did flatten out pretty nicely, um, but you know, there's still some waves, and I think if I were to just kind of spray it a little bit more, it would be, it'd be all right. Um, I'm getting a hot spot on the, on the paper, so I'm gonna drop down. There we go. That's probably better, okay. <laughs> So let's get to it. Like I said, this is a little bit bigger than we, we've typically worked with before, so I gotta loosen up. Um, whew. If you don't have watercolor paper, Heather, I would just work on whatever paper you can get, because I think there is so much you can learn just through the exercise of deconstructing the marks. Um, now, you can try the skim milk effect on any paper, see what happens, it's probably gonna buckle, um, but 
this is, we're, that's what we're doing. We're just we're just experimenting and playing around with stuff. And this this should go actually relatively quickly. Um, so I let me see. I do want to give myself a some orientation points um, with the, with the the preparatory sketch that I had uh, that I've, I completed. It kind of gave me some insight into his work that I want to share. Um, right now, though, I, I am thinking a little bit about, again, just kind of mapping and reacting to the form, kind of a quick gesture, but I'm thinking more linearly. Um, and I feel like that is how, um, that has how Van Gogh would have worked. Um, let's see, I do want, before I go, uh, Maria, yes, this will be available as a replay pretty much immediately uh, once this ends. All of the old episodes are up, so this is on number 140. So there are 139 previous episodes that you can watch as well. It, ta it does take a little while for the chat to come up, um, so if there's anything important in there. Um, let me show you the paper I've got. I'll be right back. Let's see. Well, it's just, I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, I'm just using this light, fast paper. It seemed to hold up. It's 100% cotton, um, hot pressed. Um, I don't know if it really works for watercolor, but it seemed to work for this one. Um, or at least to, to put the, just the layer on. I don't know. I don't know if it would hold up with a much more vigorous work. Um, I do I do really like this. Um, like I said, it's 100% cotton, which I enjoy working with. It does hold material pretty well, like very strongly, and is really designed for colored pencil work. Um, but I don't know. Give it a shot. Let's see how it holds up for this drawing. Um, and then to stretch it, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll try to show that a little bit later. Um, what I did is I just took a wet paper towel on the back side um, to dampen it, put the tape on the front, um, without attaching it to the to the table and so it's attached to the paper but not the table i wet the front and then basically when i you attach one side and then you try to pull to the other kind of starting from the middle working out to the corners and then trying to pull out from the corners it seemed to work a bit you know work nicely so i don't know if van gogh would have worked with watercolor paper um I did read that there is a speculation that he worked with watercolor paper or if you just worked with a kind of a rag paper. Um, you know, a lot of the rag papers are sized um, and can be dampened for printmaking processes, like an intaglio process. Um, let's see. I'm, what I'm going to try to do actually is I'm going to use the... Since I have on the screen in front of me, I'm seeing what you're seeing. I'm seeing my drawing and I'm seeing the reference image adjacent to it. I'm going to try to use that as a guide for some of the proportions. Um, just at this point, just giving myself some um, some reference points. So trying to indicate maybe where the bottom of the feet would be, where the hat would be. Uh, just using the side of the pencil. Um, this this pencil is really soft. You know, it's a 4B, and we've certainly used softer. But there's something about this quality of pencil, especially on this paper, that really reacts. It really reacts nicely, um, and it is a bit fugitive in the sense that it'll it'll um, wipe away fairly easily. So I want to be a little bit careful. Um, and I thought about having this paper. Uh, just kind of floating free on the table this time so that I could turn it upside down. Um, and, and that'll help with some of the cross hatching marks later. But um, I kind of, in, instead, I, uh, I decided to tape it down and stretch the paper. Let's see how this works. So, All right. And then Again, just kind of, I want to give myself some orientation points. So um, with this carpenter's pencil, you can see that I've kind of shaved this down. 
it really provides a nice wedge, um, really sharp edge here for really fine lines. And of course, you can lay it flat for more broad marks. And what I learned in doing the preparatory sketch, especially with a soft pencil, I really use, lose that point very quickly. And the, the variety of marks that I'm able to see in Van Gogh's work, it just makes so much sense to this. And so as if this is the first time you're working with a carpenter's pencils, and this is really only the second time I'm, I'm working with one, um, what I found helpful was really paying attention to how I'm rotating the pencil more than anything. So using this, this overhand grip on the side of the pencil, um, as I roll it up, it changes the quality of the mark. You see it's broad there. Um, when you lay it down flat, you can change the angle this way to engage the tip a bit more if you want a finer mark. It gradually gets wider as you lay it down. As you roll it, it gets wider as well. So those are just some, kind of some of the things in the technique that I think can be helpful to pay attention to. Um, and kind of think about that as we're working through some of the marks we're seeing in Van Gogh's work. Um, what you know, what marks are fairly broad, what are kind of sharper and thinner. And I believe somebody mentioned earlier that, um, uh, that there's, there's a, a calligraphic quality to this, um, to a, working with a carpenter's pencil, and I totally agree with that. So um, uh, Margo, you said you did a light outline of the figures upside down. Best job I've done getting human proportions. That's awesome. Um, and then uh, the, the question here is, did Van Gogh intend for his drawings to be practiced for a painting? I don't know. I believe, like in general, that that is always a possibility, I think, for an artist. Whenever I'm sketching, you know, I, I'm thinking in the back of my head, could this work for a painting? And so you may, you may go into a drawing to say that this is something I'm intending for a painting, and then you, you do it, and you're like, ah, no, nah, it's not really what I'm looking for. Or you're studying something about form. You're, you're thinking about it as part of a larger um, studio practice. And so if this didn't become a, a painting, you know, I'm sure it's, it's done with the intention of improving his painting. Um, Gail Claypool, are you from Bath? No way. I'm from Bath as well. That is awesome. I'm Morse High graduate, 96. I don't know if Sandy Crabtree is around, my old high school art teacher. She's the one that got me all into this. So shout out to all the high school art teachers. Shout out to Bath, Maine. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Marty Lake, uh, maybe a silly question, but are you wetting the paper and stretching it before you begin? That's what I tried for this one. Um, this right here is, uh, I, I did not do that. I just, I just taped it down, drew it, wet it, and it buckled a bit, but not too bad. I mean, if you can always flatten it out, you kind of get it damp and then kind of press it, it should hold up. Um, this is a pretty heavy paper and cotton, I think, holds together a little bit better than some other light or weight paper. So if you do if you do have a paper and it's not watercolor paper, if the heavier it is, the more it's going to hold up. And you can just be kind of gentle with it. Um, let's see. Okay. Now, the I do want to address um, the proportions, and I there was a comment about it um, that. That, that I want to I want to kind of think about with regards to, oh Stephanie thank you for the chisel point aspect of the carpenter's pencil sorry squirrel um, the with regards to proportions one of the things that I, I kind of observed in Van Gogh is that I don't know how much emphasis he placed on getting proportions accurate you know, we talk about that a lot on the show is that it can be helpful as you um, initiate your drawing to have a, a kind of a, a baseline understanding of where you fit in with regards to precision in your work. Um, and that can come in the forms of detail. You can talk about precision with regards to proportions, textures, etc. And looking at Van Gogh's work, it feels like his um, emphasis on 
proportions was was pretty minimal. I think he um, emphasized form and volume uh, and kind of the the gesture of the scene. And gesture is kind of a tricky word, but um, uh, hopefully we'll kind of analyze that as we go through farther. But one of the reasons I say that is that when, th when thinking about proportions, especially with regards to figure, you know, we open the door to talking about um, uh, uh, anatomy, essentially, understanding how the human form works. And once your brain starts to think about that, then you move into really understanding the relationships between all the various elements. So you're looking at, they say, the structure of the shoulder underneath the jacket or the way the, the spine might connect the shoulder to the hips, to the legs, and how they relate to one another. Um, and as you tilt the shoulders in one direction, it might tip the hips in another direction. And so there's, um, when, when you shift to that focus on pr proportions and anatomy, it's all about seeing that underlying unity in the figure and then breaking it down into uh, increasingly smaller parts. Now, the what what I look at when I'm when I'm seeing Van Gogh, I feel something that's a bit more fractured, right? You know, it's it's almost like when he's looking at this leg, he's engaged with that leg. When he's looking at this one, it's a different leg. It's he's focused on that, less on the relationships between them. But he's doing it in such a way that you he's not wildly inaccurate. He's not changing things up all over the place. He's not, you know, treating it like a cubist image or anything like that. But I feel like there's a, a slightly less amount of unity than than what you might see with, say, Degas. You know, Degas had a, an intense understanding of the human form and with a very precise line could describe the, um, you know, the, the anatomy underneath the skin and uh, underneath the fabric and all sorts of things. So um, I feel like... Um, Van Gogh is really more absorbed in the surface of things, right? It's the he's really concerned with the volume of the dress, you know, with um, the way the clothes fall, almost as disconnected from the figure underneath. But again, that's the way I kind of see it. I don't know if that um, uh, aligns with everybody else, and I say that. Um, knowing that, you know, I've taken a limited amount of art history courses <laughs> and those were a very long time ago. Um, but again, this is kind of my layman's understanding based on what types of things I'm trying to observe in the master copy, which is why master copies can become so valuable is because it, it helps you to deconstruct things and ask questions about how things ended up the way they do. Um, so I... Again, I'm just kind of moving quickly through the drawing. I'm reacting primarily to the contour of the figure. Um, and now, and I'm using this light overhand grip. I'm trying to map things out, but at the same time, I'm trying to under like try to trying to imagine what what motion created those marks. Uh, when I'm working, although I'm primarily looking at the screen in front of me, so I'm seeing what you're seeing, my eyes are more fixed on the reference image than the drawing. And so spending more time really engaging with the reference image and then just glancing to the drawing more as a form of orientation than anything. Um, and so there's a lot of indirect observation happening here where, again, I'm kind of fixing on the, the reference, but I'm also aware of what's happening in the periphery. Um, I want to do a quick check-in to see where I am across some of these forms. And, and then looking at the intensity of the marks, too, there is a quality to his work that 
that suggests that, you know, he's really, he's working around the drawing in a similar fashion, um, not kind of working on one area, finishing it, then moving along. Um, but you can see multiple layers of marks, not a lot of really corrective marks per se, but um, you know, we, we talk about you know, the different types of marks here. You know, we have kind of exploratory marks. We have very, very kind of controlled, delicate marks. You know, we have, um, you know, marks that are designed for kind of refined details, things like that. Um, and I, I don't see him correcting a lot, but he does go over his marks a, quite a bit. So I may have to bring maybe the leg in a little bit, but I, I need to be careful not to do too much overcorrecting. I have to ask myself now: Do I um, do I fix the marks if I see that they're off, or do I let them sit? Because I don't see again. I don't see a lot of correcting here. So if I'm really trying to draw like Van Gogh, I might have to be more confident in my marks and let them sit. Um, now this, this shoe, as we get down there, I, you know, I'm not going to finish it right now, but, um, it really, this becomes a really good example of what variety you might be able to achieve from a carpenter's pencil like this. You know, the idea that you can drag and create a broad mark, mark and then slide up along the thin edge of the pencil and it creates a fine line. And I feel like it's in the shoes here that, you know, it, it really becomes evident, you know, what material he's using. Um, and I wonder, it makes me, it does make me wonder, like, why he chose this material. Um, you know, whether it was because it gave him the marks he needed, whether it was pure convenience that he just happened to have. Uh, you know, carpenter pencils were easy to... Uh, Acquire and just grab one and go, and it gives you that variety with with one mark. You know, was he kind of the type of artist who gets pretty intense when working and doesn't want to change brushes, doesn't want to change <laughs> the pencils, you know, those types of things, which I, I sometimes get into. It can be a challenge. Um, Okay, so as I'm making some of these marks here too, I am trying to do quick check-ins to where it, see where I am relative to other forms. So as I make this line to form the edge of the dress, um, you know, where, where is it relative to these forms here? And one of the things that, you, that I can really see is that it's, it's really quite vertical here. Um, and what I, what I really find interesting, and again, in this kind of sense of disjointedness and that I don't really get an understanding of the figure underneath all of this clothing, I, I feel like he's really looking at these more as abstract forms by creating, by letting this be vertical, whether this is intentional or totally subconscious, it really emphasizes this angle here. And it pushes that shape into the, this the, the male figure here. Um, so there is that there there's there's something in the abstract quality of these forms that really kind of brings us into the unity here. There's um, rather than it being about weight on the ground, it almost feels like a, a thrust forward, kind of gentle, but um, a thrust anyways. Um, Let's see, I do want to make sure that I'm not missing any. Uh, Stephanie's saying these pencil was invented in 1565, but quickly adopted by carpenters to improve their work. That's awesome. Um, all right, okay, I do want to, okay, make sure I'm not missing any questions. So I'm just going through the list here. If you do have any questions for me, 
feel free to type them out. Um, okay, yep. And I do try to get to as many um, questions as I can. If I do miss one, please feel free to just call it out again so that I'm careful, you know, so that I'm sure not to miss it. Um, okay. Okay, just reacting to the dress form. So now we've got kind of a basic structure. I do want to, I think I want to bring the dress down a little bit. Um, feels a little bit too high on, on my drawing. Um, all right. Now what do I want to do? I kind of need, so what I have, and again, in front of me, I have the, the, the screen, so I have the small thumbnail that I'm referencing, and that I find more useful when um, focusing on larger proportions. Um, the larger one that I have on the screen to my left here is really what I'm going to be drawing from um, more so. So let me think. Now, it's difficult for me to tell which marks he would have laid down before others, you know, in, the, in, a, in a big sense of, you know, did he create an outline to then, then apply the hatching I, I feel like he worked back and forth so much, sometimes it's really difficult to tell what is what. What I see down here, for example, though, is that it's clear that the hatching here was first, and then the folds in, in the pants were added later. Uh, but then when we look at some of these other lines, where we see this line here, and they're on that center seam, it's really difficult to tell. I, and so, and part of that is because of the effect that the, that milk wash is going to have on it, the way it, the way it integrates and kind of bleeds together some of those marks. Um, so I'm just going to, we'll just kind of go through it, see what we can learn. But I, again, I, I'm not sure if I'll be able to really determine which marks came first. Um, Okay, so where do I where does that where does that leave me? Knowing that this is really soft, <laughs> I think I'll um, I'll start at the top and give myself a little bit more to go with. Um, so this is there's not not a lot of strong line. So we might have used the side of the pencil. You see a line here. And this, yeah, this is where, you know, as you, you know, now that you have a kind of foundation established, um, as you go through it and you see a mark, take a second to, to try to think through, well, what, what motion created that mark? Um, it's, like I said, it's entirely possible that I'm wildly inaccurate at this point. Um, but, I mean, I think that's kind of the benefit of these master drawings is that it, it forces you to kind of slow down and pay attention to things that it may be easy to miss um, just on first glance. And so looking at this head, for example, um, I don't get a sense of solidity in, in that drawing. There's character to the marks, and, and I think one of the things that really stands out to me in Van Gogh's work is just the sheer variety. Uh, and, and if you're able to get, kind of zoom into the drawing, I really feel like this head is perhaps the best example of the variety of marks. Even though it's not the most dynamic aspect of the drawing, you just see that contrast between you know, these, these broad marks here on the hat. Um, you come down here and these really fine 
lines here for the back of the head and the way the hair is folding. And then you these kind of, you know, really loopy calligraphic lines for the ear. You know, it's, I don't know how quick they were, uh, but, you know, he's not spending a lot of time really studying that ear. And then you come down here and then there's this kind of patch of cross hatching. Um, I'm assuming it's some sort of beard. Uh, so just so much variety, but he's thinking about it really, really abstractly in the sense that he's reacting to the form itself, not working from some sort of some sort of kind of preconceived understanding of how the human head should be drawn, if that makes sense. Um, I you know I don't really know how much. Um, study Van Gogh would have put into understanding the human form. Um, if he did have a lot of understanding of it, I kind of feel like he may have kind of intentionally abandoned it or he's really shifting his focus. Um, and this kind of reacting to the form. Um, oh, Ursula asked a question, what the title of this Van Gogh drawing? Um, Honestly, I don't know if you, the, the link that takes you to the Wikimedia page. I think that has the the best is probably the best resource. Uh, I can't remember which collection this was from. Um, so I apologize; it kind of escapes my mind. And so as I as I work down this left side, I'm kind of thinking about you can see kind of rolling the pencil, building up kind of this broad shadow into this area here. And I feel like he's really, he's not spending a long time studying it, but he's paying attention to um, that turning edge. Um, we're gonna get into some of the cross hatching too. Along this backside, it's all one mark and really kind of thins out here along the base of the coat. And I do get a sense that, you know, it's not one mark and he's done. He's, he's feeling out the edges here. You can see a, a vertical quality to the marks here. Look at this emphasis right in here. He's really He's really applying the pencil in this area, um, which makes me think that thematically this was an important aspect to him, that point of con connection. And what's actually really kind of cool is the way he's rendered this arm, which I presume to be the woman's arm, um, but it's, you know, the way these forms interact with one another you could you could visualize that arm as being his as well. It's like a Venn diagram where this arm is the common denominator between the two. Um, really interesting thing. And then he's he's putting so much emphasis on the uh, on that on that shape here. So he may come back to that a little bit later. Um, Let's see. Um, yeah, Stephanie, uh, these are wonderful observations, so thank you for sharing that. And if anybody else is, if you're observing anything, um, you know, if this is a drawing you're familiar with or if you're working in real time with us, um, this is the forum to, to share your observations in, as well. Um, that's why we're drawing together and not, it's not about me kind of explaining it because I could very easily be, again, wildly inaccurate, but you know, we do the best we can. So that's me hedging because I, <laughs> I want to make sure I cover everything. Don't trust my own observations sometimes. All right. This layer of hatching that he's got, he... 
we talked about hatching, was it the Michelangelo drawing? Man, I got to really work on this when I, um, when I see artists like Van Gogh, like Michelangelo, uh, Degas, um, just the control and the hatching, it blows my mind. <laughs> And it makes me realize how how uncontrolled my hatching is. I don't do a whole lot of it. And what I mean by that is if, if you're kind of wondering what the heck this guy's talking about, um, hatching is, you know, a way of building up value. And you see that a lot in the back in the backside of this man's jacket, for example. Um, hatching is a, again, way to build up value. But he's really using the the hatch marks as cross contour forms to reinforce the volume of the figure. Not in, in a super precise way, but there's a big difference between making marks that are perfectly horizontal here versus that slight angle that he's given it. So that's very intentional. And you can see here that there is a shift in the angle of the marks right in the top of the jacket. So he's not just getting kind of lost in the rhythmic movements of creating these cross hatches. He's thinking through the angle of them in a way that is going to reinforce that volume. It's going to say something about the form. Um, and again, I almost feel like he's drawing the jacket, not the man underneath it. Um, which is kind of an interesting thing. I remember doing a copy of Van Gogh years ago, his boots, um, which were kind of similar in a way in terms of approach because, um, you know, you could tell he was just, he was just absorbed in the, the form. Um, now, and you could, you could see how this scene here seems to break the form for him. He's changing up the direction of the marks. There is, I think, one, one kind of pass of these marks, and I can, I get a feeling, looking if you if you look closely at the hatch marks, you see some marks where the where it's heavier on one end and lighter on the other, and then some marks where that's reversed. I'm sorry, I'm kind of creeping off the window here. I just realized. <laughs> um, so it gives me a sense that he is kind of zigzagging back and forth, not exactly, you know, not in a, a perfect rhythm, but there is a kind of a back and forth quality. Um, and I get a sense that he created these, these marks first because you can see them kind of carry into this section here. And there's a, a light pass here. Um, and then he, he actually really changes direction. So the cross hatching really shifts. He's kind of falling down the form here. Uh, and then there's uh, the layer of cross hatching where he's running mostly vertically here. And he seems to emphasize this little kind of bulge there. All right. Um, <laughs> and moments go. It's like spot the difference. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Heather, you're talking about the Denver Art Museum. Uh, yeah. If yeah, that was a great exhibit. If you haven't, if you're not aware of it, we have on Artist Network. If you're a member, it's going to be in the video library. Um, a series called Deco Decoding um, Degas, uh, and so. I, I should have mentioned that in the Degas exhibit, um, but when you're talking about the Denver Art Museum, it made me think about it. Um, that where um, Desmond O'Hagan, he's a Denver artist, I worked with him and he, we filmed him creating master copies of a Degas drawing um, leading into a finished Degas past, uh, master copy of Pastel. 
Um, and we got to interview the curator of the museum. Um, so there's, if you like master copies, you could check that out on Artist Network. All right. Where am I, what am I looking at here? I think I need to, what I'm trying to analyze is what's happening here to try to deconstruct some of the, uh, some of the, the, the stages. And one thing I'm seeing is some eraser work here and here that I hadn't seen before. And that was clearly done after the fact because I saw it down here along this, uh, this edge of the dress, but I didn't notice that up there. Um, and he's got it in some of the folds. So what I, what I think he did is I think he probably just moved from piece to piece. Uh, so now this is a really good kind of master class on, again, cross hatching. Um, you know, not me. <laughs> Don't look at what I'm doing. Look at what Van Gogh's doing because he's better at it than I am. Um, the this this use of cross contour, I, I refer to it as dimensional hatching, to reinforce the form. Um, you know, I, I talk about that in my book. The the different forms of hatching you have: parallel hatching, you have dimensional hatching. And, and then you can have what's called disjointed, or I would refer to as disjointed, where you know you have the hatch marks change and move in directions that make no sense, you know, and not really aligning with the form. I just I realize how uncontrolled my hatch marks are. Anybody else have that trouble? <laughs> or is it just me? Um, and this is why we practice though, right? You know, I got a, there's a element of discipline that is required to improve any skill. And I need to intentionally practice, um, cross hatching like this more often. Um, And so when I, one of the things I'm playing around with is the, the angle of my, um, my pencil here to engage the, the tip, but it's, you know, it's, it's very quickly losing the point of the pencil. Now this is, this is where I would really like to be able to flip the paper upside down <laughs> and just curve using the natural curve of the wrist. Um, but I cannot do it because I taped the paper down. Um, now, one of the things I try to do when looking at the hatching, you know, we talked about earlier, is trying to determine which direction the mark is going. I think he went right over this edge. Um, and that's really challenging to do sometimes. So you try to just try to do the best you can. Uh, and what I'm what I'm also paying attention to is um, I, I want to be mindful of where I need to end up. Oh darn it! Um, in this cross hatching. Uh, kind of pattern. So if you look down here, for example, um, the marks are kind of running more at an angle like this, and they seem to radiate up. So they're kind of pretty much horizontal as we move there. And that could totally be, again, if, if the paper upside down and he's just kind of moving quickly with the, the natural curve of his wrist, um, he could be achieving that through the, through that through those means. Um, um, I wonder if I can, let me see if I can do this without getting in the shot. All right. 
Everybody see this? Now I'm upside down. So if, if we're able to use that natural curve of the wrist, move much more quickly. But look how uneven my marks are. That's, that's an area for improvement is what that is. Um, and that gives me some sort of at least baseline. Um, now I'm going to drop the pencil down a little bit. Um, just define the bottom of the, the, the jacket. But it's really an interesting kind of broken line there. And then really fascinating what all these marks are right in this area. So many of these marks really kind of overlapping. I'm going to switch. I, I do need to come back to this area, but I would like to sharpen my pencil a little bit. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is work on an area here where I, I know that there's kind of more of this broad dragging motion. Um, and then just looking at the direction of the marks, seeing them run kind of diagonally there. And then there's this trail off of the hatch marks here with this um, kind of heavier, more calligraphic line here. And, and in these areas, I get a sense that he's really just rolling the pencil to achieve some of these marks. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to work on a scrap piece of paper. Just to kind of sharpen that up a little bit so I can have I, what I want is a sharper line in here. And then what you can see is that there's a there's a fold kind of right in here, and there's this, um, there's this pass of, of uh, marks that I think actually he, he flipped this upside down and was working this way. Getting more dense towards the bottom. Holy smudges. See, that's the thing is I don't I don't get a sense that he was really smudging the, the paper a whole lot. Um, so my guess is that he was working on some sort of drawing board or easel. Um, which would certainly change, uh, you know, change the, the, the approach here. Over here you can see this really um, nice transition where he's dragging the pencil down here and then just naturally moving up, engaging that thin edge of the, um, of the pencil. And then 
Let's see, it gives it a little bit more dense and dark in here. And as we, as we come down this arm, it's really interesting. He's observing these folds, but he kind of hits it in one mark. I don't think I really got that mark, but I don't think correcting it will really help. So I want to capture the, the quality of the mark. The fact that he did it in one go is more important than the accuracy of that mark. So this is where it's really important to observe the, the changing direction of the hatch marks so that the hatch marks here on this sleeve are different than the back. And again, this is why I really feel like he's, he's focusing, he, he really segments things in his mind. So when he's drawing that arm, he's drawing the arm, not understanding how it connects to the rest of the form. Um, Wilma is saying, as one of your favorite artists, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, um, yeah, Samana is saying, interesting that this kind of hatching on some comic book art, like the small hatches on uh, Mobius, I didn't know that they are that useful. Awesome. Yeah, like hatching is such a skill. <laughs> and I don't do it a whole lot. And and so it, this the series of master copies has really made me aware of that. Um, and it, you know, you look at, you know, the great comic art, comic book artists and such skill with line work and things like hatching, really efficient. Now this, I want to get back to this here um, because I think he really lays on the pencil. Um, so he's, this is, this is perhaps a softer material. I don't know if then what he would have used, but I think general, in general, carpenter's pencils are, are soft. But, you know, look at how, as you follow along the curve of this arm, it's a series of broken marks that... Um, that all accumulate together. Um, and I think one of the, the reasons why, you know, people respond to Van Gogh, or at least why I respond to Van Gogh's work, is that kind of, there's a kind of in uninhibited quality to the marks. Um, and that can be really challenging. Um, he's kind of reacting to the form in a very honest way. And we, again, one of the, the most valuable things about master copies like this is that it, it puts us in the mind of the artist in, in a way. And it's a form of mind reading. And there's something in the quality of the marks that that we we really pick up. Um, uh, in terms of like who that person is, and, and I kind of lost those hatch marks, so I need to be really careful here. <laughs> Yeah, so I, what I probably should do is just take some time just cross-hatching and just practicing as a hand-eye coordination exercise. It can be valuable to do that. Uh, another area where he really seems to be focusing is this, and this is what I, I love. You know, he, um, you know, he's thinking so much about volume and when we get on this side of the dress, or the jacket, I mean, you know, how, 
how intensely he's layering on this value here to create that turning edge. And so he's he's really broken this down into two dimensions. There's the the lateral dimension and the, the longitudinal direction dimension. Um, and he's letting those marks be visible. Um, you know, we talked about this before. You know, I think if you know if you if you're just starting out and you don't know where to where um, where to put your energy the, the most, I would forget trying to control your pencil. You know, that's going to be the thing that kind of gets us the most. We're going to spend the most time worrying about is just how do we control this thing. But try to forget that as much as you can and just think about what shape am I drawing and what direction do I need to make the marks, right? Um, and I feel like uh, Van Gogh is breaking it down like that as well. He's thinking, of what is that shape? What direction do I make the marks? And then there's not a whole lot more that he's, he's really doing. Oh, I, kinda, I can move up to here. I didn't do this pattern here. And he may be asking himself as he's Um, as he's making these marks, you know, what, what's the return of my investment if I correct any of these marks? Um, do I, if I really fuss with them, am I losing something? Um, am I going to gain something by really correcting these marks and refining them? I don't know. Um, yeah, and Romero's saying you can tell he didn't use smudging techniques, he just used it's just clean line work and shading, um, you know, the hatch work, yeah. Um, let's see, uh, did you do, okay, I just wanna make sure I'm not missing any drawing, uh, any questions. Oh, Edie, that's a good question, wondering if you drew this from memory. I wonder, my sense is no, um, but I think that's really just an, an, an intuitive guess, it's not really, based on anything beyond just my gut says he was looking. Um, just because the, the marks feel like they were observed. He's reacting to something that he's seeing. I love this right in here, it gets dark. So now I'm trying to also think about what my gut says about the um, the pace of the marks. Were they fast? Were they were they slow? But they made to look fast, <laughs> which is it's certainly a thing. Um, you know, a lot of kind of brushwork, you know, drawings and things can. Um, you can have the appearance of being made very quickly when they're actually quite slow and deliberate. Um, and I look at like this curve here along the base, and he's really, he really attacks it in many multiple attempts. And I actually, I feel like I need to bring that down. Let's see what happens. Kind of, it kind of migrated north a little bit there, didn't it? So bring that down a little bit. <sighs> oh, so welcome everybody. If you are new, I just want to let you know that what you're watching is Drawing Together with Artist Network. My name's Scott Meyer, and we do this every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, we are at episode 140, which is a lot, a lot more than I thought we'd get when I started this show back in March of 2020. Um, who knew? Um, and then, you know, we're, the plan is to transition 
uh, and to incorporate other media as well. So uh, we'll be I'll be doing some live streams with drawing as well as watercolor, oils, pastels, things like that. Shake things up a little bit, um, but all with the mindset of, again, challenging ourselves um, with you know unique subjects so that we grow in particular ways. So that's what we do as artists. We we give ourselves challenges, and and then we grow, and we just do the practice. So looking down in here on this leg, we could see, actually, you know what I'm seeing is that there is this layer of hatching first. And this light layer here, I think he lifted with an eraser there. And then he built some of these folds on top. And then we see this, we see one kind of pass with the hatching running diagonally there. But he really works this area. He's observing some, some unique stuff that's happening in there. And I think what the, I think ultimately the, the biggest takeaway uh, from all of this is to also try to understand what um, you know really what what was important to Van Gogh. You know we can see where he's emphasizing certain things and try to compare it to what's important to you in your own work, right? What um, where do you put your emphasis? Where do you find yourself laboring on certain things? Where do you, um, you know, find yourself kind of, kind of ignoring? Are there certain aspects of a drawing that you might ignore, um, and or you know, kind of common areas that you find yourself having to, kind of address repeatedly in your work? It can just be kind of a fascinating exploration of your own mind to see what. Um, you know, particular biases we might have when we look at a subject. Are we focusing on the character? Are we focusing on the form? On um, you know, is it about the subject? Is it about the optical information we're gathering? All sorts of things. Um, let's see. Oh, Ursula is talking about copying one of Degas' bathers. That would actually be a really great one to study in pastel. And what Degas also did was he worked a lot in um, combination of charcoal and pastel. Okay. I find myself kind of escaping sometimes in the drawing, you know, but it, by that I mean like there are areas in the drawing I'm working and I, I get kind of stuck so I'll, I'll escape somewhere else. So I'll start working on another part of the drawing. Um, and I don't know why that is, but um, you can see actually there's some, yeah, there's a kind of a pass here that's kind of vertical up in the section. And then there's this diagonal pass. There's, a, there's, a, there's this section here where he's dropping them vertically. And then here it, he changes dimension. Um, okay. I think it's starting to come together. She's drawn too wide, is what I'm observing. Um, but that's okay. Actually, I think this arm is too narrow. Let 
And that might help take in some of that. Um, I'm kind of curious about, see what happens if I correct this. Oh, look at that. There's so much graphite on there, it just slid. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, and then where are we? Oh, we're only about about an hour and ten minutes in. Um, typically, these go run about two hours. Um, and I do want to give a little bit more weight here. Feel better about that, but I still didn't quite hit it. Um, that's all right. I don't want to mess with it too much and lose the immediacy of his work. Okay, I'm going to move from left to right here. Now I'm moving over to this section. Now you can see he's really he really rounds out his marks here. But I do think he started from right to left. You can just see on, on his marks the, the impact point on the page. So then you, he either flipped the, the drawing upside down or he contorted himself like I'm doing. And I'm resting my hand on this. Let me give myself a little bit of a makeshift mall stick here. That is horrible. All right. <laughs> this is so hard to control. <laughs> Let's see. That's really tricky to do. <laughs> um, I, again, another practice. Then I another area that I need to practice is, I don't know, contorting myself for for the hatching. But man, that's just when you see somebody do that that's just that's just hours I mean, that's just sheer hours of work that's how you do it so kudos to all you master hatchers And then if you look at this dress, there's this, there's this line here. Um, and he, he breaks up the hatching, just a, a series here. Um, and then he, there's another change in plane here. And he breaks it up again. So there's another, another pass here. And that shift in broken hatching is um, really helpful for reinforcing that form. Um, I feel like there's this overall kind of wash of hatching here. I do need to let me clean this up a little bit. And I promise we'll get to the milk in a bit. <laughs> so, again, if you're joining and you're reading the the, uh, uh, the list of materials, um, yeah, we're going to be using milk in a little bit to fix this drawing. Um, yeah, really interesting overlapping of hatch marks here. And like this, just this section of the dress, how he's broken that up. So again, that's where I, I feel like what he's, um, what he's really good at doing is, you know, breaking a, a, a subject down into smaller bits and then engaging fully with each bit. Like you see just a, just a bit of a right foot right in there. Now, this is a drawing that I think works better at a larger scale. 
it was a little bit harder working with this smaller scale, just because of the mostly because of the scale of the hatching. Um, it was it was noticeably different. I could not get the marks to feel as fine as what I see here in the drawing. And um, I think if you ever get a chance to work from real life, you know, that's going to be the that's that's where you really learn a lot about the about the um, the artist you're copying. And there are you, know, you can get a you can um, get essentially a pass to study and copy in various museums. And so at the Louvre or I think the National Gallery had a kind of an artist in residence program for copying and you can go into the museums and you know there's certain rules that apply but you can copy. We used to go to in school in Baltimore go to the Walters Art Museum and draw there a lot. And then right in here, yeah, it's interesting that he's he's really really concerned with volume and you know not not in sense of light and shadow, but uh, in terms of you know using cross hatching and contour line. You can see real, how he really wraps his marks around there. And I'm just about done, I think, with these with these marks. I'm going to come down to this foot here. And look at this, like he's he's really reacting to the form in front of him. There's no no preconceived, you know, understanding of how to draw a shoe, what a shoe should look like. He's just going for that form. You see in that shape. Look down here on this foot, it's the same way. I mean, when you look at that that shape, he's that's what a wonky form. And then, yeah, you get these kind of zigzaggy forms here. All right, well, there's pretty much, it's pretty close to done. I'm gonna come back in and darken up some of these marks that feel a little bit too light. Missing some marks in here. Uh, but I'm hoping that this kind of revealed something to you all about Van Gogh's mark, his marks, his process to some degree. And again, I don't know as if this is how he actually drew, but the exercise of doing a master copy gets us to slow down and analyze the marks and apply our own kind of intuitive reaction to the marks that we're seeing and see how it might inform our own thoughts about our own drawing. So the process we use, the decisions we make as we navigate the drawing, where we put our emphasis, you know, the types of choices as artists that we make throughout the drawing process. Um, all right. Let's see. Hope I didn't miss any. Well, let's see. Um, we are, we're only an hour and 20 minutes in, so this is going to be a short one. <laughs> and this is the largest drawing that we've done. Um, where could I improve? Let me think about that. I, I want to, I think it's important to kind of think through that. Um, I think this is a, a stronger, um, stronger version than 
um, the, the previous sketch that I did, um, in terms of the proportions, um, you know, I think it's I'm learning more about the way he works, actually. But um, you know, certainly more that we could do. If you know, if we do a bunch of these, I think you'd really start to adopt the language, the visual language of his marks. The one thing that I see here is there's a, a quality of mark here that looks like it's erased along that edge. Um, and I think that is largely to help with that turning of the form. And we see that here. It helps with the turning of the form because it brings that highlight in on top. He's a little bit here in that. It kind of smudges a little bit too in an interesting way. And there's some along this edge. Looks like there's some right in here too. Oh, and I do feel like he, there's some in some of these folds here. And what that does actually is in an interesting way is it, you know, there's not very much erasing that's happening here. What he's doing it or appears is um, he, he's using that to, to bring out form. He's not correcting with the eraser. This is what I'm saying. Is So if I look in here, if I look here, this is probably the, the most obvious one. He's, he's bringing out that highlight and he's breaking up that cross hatching. So he's describing something there. He's not just, um, not just correcting. And that's something we talk about a lot in this show is that the eraser, uh, you know, always, always be describing the form, just saying something about the form or about the subject. Um, every tool is an opportunity to say something about that form. It's interesting, looking at this, these marks now, I kind of feel like he went through the same process I did. He started with that, the back of the coat too high, and then he dropped it down a bit. Um, bring this out a little bit more. Um, yeah, it's pretty wild. All right, now fixative. Should we do it? Let's go for it. Um, using the eraser just to pick up some of this residual stuff, but you know his paper is not all that clean. I'm not worried about it. I'm just picking some up. I need to get a new kneaded eraser. This one is really starting to get sticky and is leaving leaving marks on the paper rather than lifting them right here. Look at that. It's awesome. I learned long ago that being precious with my paper was a futile, a futile exercise. I, I don't really have it in me to keep the paper clean. So I don't do that anymore. All right. So we're going to fix this thing with milk. If you don't have skim milk, you can think you can just water down whole milk. That's what I read online at least. And nothing is wrong online, right? So, but... I did try it with this, um, and, and you can see that it dried quite nicely. I learned a few things from it. Um, I just have a wide, flat brush. I'm going to stand up here so I can do this. Uh, wide, flat brush, just dipping in. This is just skim milk, and I, what I want to do is make sure that I look at the reference image for any sort of guide, right? Um, is lighter up here than it is down here. So my guess is that he started up here applying some of the milk to the paper. Um, now, I learned in the preparatory drawing to, in general, bring the milk into the drawing, not, not away. See how it... it um, it'll, it'll bleed a little bit. Um, which is how the tone builds up on the page. But in general, actually I'm just gonna go straight across. Look at that, it's, that really dried it out, didn't it? It really dried on the page.
It does some really beautiful things to the surface of the drawing. But, you know, it, this one, this kind of dried a bit too quickly, didn't it? This is all an experiment. So I can't get that up right there, so I must not have applied it very well there. So if you work, work quickly, you see how you can, if you drag some of the marks in there, you can quickly pull it back. I'm kind of being a slob with it right now. And then you can see now at the bottom of the page, the brush is built up a lot on the, you know, picked up a lot of the, the, the graphite and it's building up tone on that bottom. I didn't do a very good job on this one, let me see. Only got one shot though, huh? Yeah, this is not coming back up. <laughs> it's all right. But, so, I, like I said, I've seen people use a sprayer to do this, and that seems to work a bit better. I missed a little bit there. But it does a surprisingly good job at fixing the drawing. It doesn't move. Look at that, that came up too much. Drop more milk on there. Oh, and this is really buckling now, so I should have used a better paper. But it'll dry flatter, don't worry. So I'm just gonna try to smooth things out a little bit. Finesse the contours a touch. I don't know, who knows, maybe he did have a way of spraying it. Pretty wild, huh? I do, I love the surface that it, it creates, what it does to the, um, just to the surface, the texture of it all. Um, it provides just this quality that, you know, I think it says something, I mean, it you, you see it in the work, but, I, you know, not, I never really thought that it could just be a layer of fixative that creates this particular quality, especially when you look down at some of the line work in there. And I did read somewhere that he preferred to work on damp paper. Um, actually, I wonder what happens if I, if I can erase here. Nope, that didn't do anything. Yeah, that's really, really stuck now. So, but the, you can see that streak there. I let it sit before addressing it too, too long. And so now it's there for good. And it's just part of the work. But it could be an interesting thing to explore, especially building up layers of this, right? Can you imagine, you know, doing some line work, applying a layer of the egg wash, then going on top of that, doing a bit more, adding some brush work. I think I really want to experiment with this a bit more. Um, if anybody learns anything more about this technique and how to do it better, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and then in the end, like I said, you'll get, you'll build up a tone. You can see it against this edge here that's consistent with what we're seeing in the original. So I feel like this is getting us closer to what, what we would have actually seen him do. Um, I think he just would have done a better job at it because this is what he does a lot. You know, most of his drawings apparently were fixed like this. So, yeah, and it's just skim milk. That's all I'm using right now. Um, there is a company, I can't remember who it is, that made the casein um, spray fixative, which would essentially, I imagine, would be a similar um, thing, so a similar effect. Um, but I, like I said, I bring out this. I just, it's got a really nice surface to it now. Actually, I'm kind of curious. Can you draw on it? This is a little slick. I guess 
you can draw on it. You can draw on top of it and maybe do another layer. Um, I don't know. Experiment with it. That's what we do here. <laughs> we do a drawing and then we just ruin it by adding milk to it. I don't know if we ruined it. I'm just making stuff up. But um, you're going to try things out sometimes, see if they work. So, um, all right. We moved through it quick. That's only an hour and a half. But I don't have much else to show you. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining me. Uh, this was a lot of fun. We're going to be doing more of this Art of the Steel series. Um, I look forward to working in other media as well. So maybe we'll get into some painting, watercolor, pastel, etc. Yeah, Jackie, I think the, uh, the cats are going to love this thing. Who knows? I may come back into the studio here and just find a room full of cats. But um, so thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful week. Join me next week. We're working on... Where's my drawing? Where'd my sketchbook go? Darn it. It was right here. I'm working on a... We're going to do a rocket ship. I found this cool lift off of a SpaceX rocket that I want to do because it's got a great quality of light, values, scale. There's so much we're going to deal with next week, so I'm really looking forward to that one. So I'm working on the preparatory drawing for that one right now. I will get that posted as soon as I can. I will be out of town. If anybody knows what NAMTA is, NAMTA is an, it's an art materials trade association. Um, I'm going to be there talking with artists, talking with man, uh, manufacturers of, of all sorts of art materials. I'm going to be gathering content for Artist Network. Um, but I will be back in time for next week's episode. If you're new, please come join us again every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. That's what we're here for. Um, yeah. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you again.